Hi, good afternoon from Helsinki. Welcome to day three of our UNU Wider Development Conference on COVID and development. Um, my name is Rachel Giselquist. I'm a senior research fellow here at UNU Wider. And I'm very pleased to be here today to uh, chair and introduce our, our keynote speaker, Professor Stefan Lindbergh. He will be speaking on COVID-19, trends for democracy and autocracy. So around the world, um, it seems the pandemic has been linked with new restrictions on political freedoms and rights. And this comes at a time when observers of democracy have been warning for well over a decade of declines in global democracy. It's a topic that we've paid some attention to, certainly at UNU Wider. Uh, I would say linked in particular with our work on the state and on issues of state legitimacy and, and capacity. In his lecture, uh, Professor Lindbergh will present the latest findings from the VDEM Institute on the trends for democracy and autocracy in the world and the effects that the pandemic has had for rights and freedoms. So the VDEM Institute has done and is doing some of the most, indeed maybe the most exciting and rigorous work on conceptualizing and measuring democracy worldwide and historically. And it's, it's also one of the largest ever social science data collection efforts. Professor Lindbergh is professor of political science and director of the university-wide research infrastructure VDEM Institute at the University of Gothenburg founding a principal investigator of varieties of democracy, founding director of the National Research Infrastructure DEMSCORE, Wallenberg Academy Fellow, author of Democracy and Elections in Africa, co-author of Varieties of Democracy, as well as other books and over 60 articles on issues of democracy, elections, democratization, autocratization, accountability, clientelism, women's representation, voting behavior, and so on. He's also a friend to Wider, uh, and he's currently collaborating in our project on clientelism and development. Uh, so I'm very pleased to, to welcome him here this afternoon in Helsinki. The way this session will run is that Professor Lindbergh will give his lecture, and then we'll have about 15, 20 minutes for questions and answer discussion with the audience. So I would encourage those of you joining us today to please think of the questions you might like to ask and, and pose them, type them in on your screen. I think there's a Q&A box uh, or a chat box. So get the questions to us. Please send, feel free to send in questions during the lecture. And then when we turn to the Q&A session, I will pose as many of the questions as, as we have time for. Uh, so without further ado, let me turn over to Professor Lindbergh for his keynote address. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, thank you for that too kind introduction. Um, and thank you for uh, the, to UNU Wider for inviting me to give this keynote here today. <clears throat> As Rachel mentioned, I will uh, talk uh, about three things really that are interconnected. First, the trends for democracy and autocracy in the world uh, with a special focus on what's happened the last 10 years. Um, and then secondly, based on our pandemic backsliding project, what has happened with democracy and threats to democracy as a result, a direct result of the pandemic in the world. And then thirdly, I will also <coughs> go into, based on our Case for Democracy project, um, to say uh, a little bit about what, why these uh, developments, besides sort of threatening democracy, which is valuable in and of itself, um, but why it also has other ramifications and consequences. So <clears throat> let's start. So based on, this is the Democracy Report 2021 from the VDEM Institute. Um, and <clears throat> I wanna highlight three findings that we presented this year. Uh, the share of the world population living in autocracies have uh, basically skyrocketed. And now two thirds of the world population live in autocracies. Let's look at the evidence for this. So this is the kind of <clears throat> typical 
uh, graph that you would see, whether it's VDEM index, uh, VDEM indices or, or other, uh, where uh, you take the average across countries, right? And <clears throat> with this kind of graph that some people have been using, then it doesn't seem that the development in the world is that uh, radical in terms of autocratization. <clears throat> but remember, in this type of graph, the seashells with 90,000 inhabitants count as much as India with 1.3 something million, a billion uh, uh, inhabitants. Now, democracy is ruled by the people, so we think it matters how many people are actually affected. And <clears throat> if we look at this last uh, sort of 10 years here, look at what happens when we weigh this by population. Then all these downward trends are much more pronounced and in all regions of the world, including um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where the development has so far been least pronounced. Okay, it's in fact, if you look at the world average there in the middle, the black line, and you draw a line back like this, then you can see that we are back on a, the level of democracy that the average global citizen enjoy is now back to even before 1990 and the end of the Cold War. That should put things into perspective, I would think. Right? We can look at this in terms of regime types. So same underlying data in VDEM, but using the regimes of the world classification. Um, and this long word trend of closed dictatorships that were decreasing in number for a long time has now started to go up again. Right? And since 1972 and with the third wave of democratization, uh, there was an increase in what we know now call electoral autocracies, the ones that uh, seek to emulate democracy, holding multi-party elections on paper, but are not good enough, or media freedom is not good enough, or freedom of association is not good enough, or all of it is not good enough. So they can't be classified as democracy. So Belarus, the Russia, uh, Turkey today, and so on. Okay. And taking together these two types of dictatorships, then uh, <coughs> account um, for a majority of countries in the world and a two thirds of the world population. So that's the first point I wanna highlight, that the, 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 this uh, wave of what we've called the third wave of autocratization is really a global phenomena and it has really brought the world back to uh, 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 levels that we saw last at the end of the Cold War. Electoral autocracies are the most common regime type, um, and together uh, with closed autocracies, there are 87 states now. Okay, so secondly, that th this was like what regimes you are, countries are. Let's look at the same thing, but now in terms of which countries are changing for the better or for the worse, right? So, <clears throat> and again, here the picture is, uh, that autocratization is accelerating, right? The share of the world population living in autocratizing countries, countries undergoing negative change, uh, has also skyrocketed, and it's now one third of the world population. Let's look at the evidence for this, right? So here with that blue sort of purple line, you see then in each year, the number of countries that are in an episode of democratization, and the third wave with the crescendo here uh, in the early mid 90s, the end of the Cold War, end of Soviet Union and so on, lots of, of democratization happening in Africa and Asia, at most 72 countries. Uh, that's dwindled down to 16. And at the same time, from around 2000, the number of countries that are in an episode of autocratization has increased, now numbering 25. And those 25 countries, home to 34% of, of the world population. These 16 are very small and only account for 4% of the world population. So that's uh, really looking at it from this perspective, this started some 20 years ago. And this is really worrying because in this publication that came out in democratization, it's open access, we looked at all episodes of autocratization in democracies since 1900 to the present. And almost 80% of them ended up with democracy breaking down. 
So the statistical probability that the countries that are now in an episode of autogradization, that they would survive as democracies, is really slim. Which countries are we talking about? Here is a world map. Uh, and you can see these uh, countries that are sort of uh, purple uh, shaded, that are have over the past 10 years improved on democracy, and the red ones declined including the United States under Trump, of course, but also Brazil, India, Turkey, Hungary, and so on, Philippines, and so on, right? Um, the top 10 are these ones in terms of autocratization in the period 2010 to 20, right? <clears throat> and you can see by the markings here that most of them started as democracies, either liberal or electoral democracies, and are now one or the other form of dictatorship, okay. including Hungary from around 2018, um, and now also India, that by our latest measure as end of December 2020, can no longer be classified as an electoral democracy, but is an electoral autocracy. Has a lot to do with uh, uh, media freedom and suppression of civil society, and I'll show that in a second. But what's really struck us when we started to look at how autocratization unfolds in these countries and the others is how similar the processes are. Right? So here are the top 10 again. There are a couple of exceptions um, with Thailand and the coup. Um, and, and it will look the same for Myanmar, I guess, with next year's um, uh, uh, measure. But overall, the pattern is very similar. And it's actually very similar to what Putin started to do in the early 2000s in Russia. First, if you look at which indicators changed the first in this process of autocratization, well, what do you do? Well, first, you start to engage in suppression of the media and freedom of expression, censorship effort, and uh, freedom of academic and cultural expression, and repress civil society, right? And only when you come far enough on those, then you start to attack things like the free and fairness of elections. Uh, and with Turkey, all these indicators start to change much earlier. Then you attack the formal institutions of democracy. So it's almost like there's an autocratic playbook or dictator's playbook out there, and they uh, know what to do. Okay, uh, and India here with a, a black line in the middle compared to some of its neighbors. It's been quite a, a, a radical decline on the liberal democracy index. Uh, and you can see it's now uh, quite substantially below um, countries like Nepal and even Sri Lanka, although it's going south in Sri Lanka as well and Nepal to some extent. Um, and even if it's still above, obviously, Bangladesh and, and, and Pakistan. When you look at, okay, so what's changed over these 10 years here? What are the aspects of the liberal democracy index? It has 48 indicators, okay? <clears throat> we'll look at the, the top 20 here, right? Um, and the ones that have changed the most. And remember, most of these indicators at that level, they are measured on a uh, zero to four. Uh, measurement level. So a minus two, or even a minus one, is really a substantial change. Top of the line, government censorship of the media. Second, civil society repression. And then you have EMB autonomy, uh, which happened with the, the last elections in India. Before that, it was nothing, but then it was the autonomy of the EMB was really compromised. Again, then civil society, entry and exits, and so on. It's a lot of media indicators. So secondly, point here, this uh, a third wave of autocratization is accelerating. Uh, it's engulfing a third of the world's population, 2.6 billion people, whereas the countries democratizing are really small and have a very small share of the global population. And when countries autocratize, they typically follow a very similar pattern. And that includes India. Uh, with its 1.37 billion citizens. Okay, 
Thirdly then, this threat to freedom of expression is not only affecting the countries that are in a real sort of what we can establish as an episode of autocratization. It, we saw that it typically starts in that end when, uh, and, and those are among the indicators that change first. So by intuition, we should also see uh, uh, freedom of expression being threatened in countries that are not yet classified as autocratizing. And that's exactly what we see. So here, if we look at, in this graph, uh, different components of different varieties of democracy, right? Um, and if you're above this diagonal line, then uh, things have gotten better in more countries than it's gotten worse. If you're below the line, it's gotten worse in more countries then it's gotten better. Worst of all, freedom of expression. Um, in the last 10 years in 32 countries, and these are statistically significant changes, right? Only. If we dive into the indicators that make up these components, then it looks like this, similar to the India graph, right? But now with the number of countries where this indicator has declined statistically significantly, above the blue line, you have the top 10. <clears throat> Eight of the top 10 have to do with freedom of expression. And then you have election, free and fairness of elections, and top, uh, on the very top civil society repression with 50 countries where this has declined substantially and statistically significant in the last 10 years. So that's the third point that I wanted to bring up here. Um, from this, the, about the trends for the autocracy, democracy and autocracy in the world, um, that the threat to freedom of expression and media intensifies. Um, these 32 countries where that component has declined substantially, and it was only 19, just three years ago. So it's accelerating. Repression of civil society goes hand in hand with this, and it's also intensifying. Um, and, and, and there are these 50 countries where we register substantial, statistically significant deterioration. So that's sort of the three big things I wanted to highlight um, that, that we discuss in, in the annual report um, that I think really uh, speaks to what's going on in the world during this wave of autocratization. And then, of course, the pandemic happened. So with uh, financial support from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden, we really wanted to, we were really worried about um, uh, the effects of COVID-19 on democracy in the world, because um, democracy is also a foreign policy priority for Sweden. They call it the drive for democracy. Um, so we took up the challenge to measure factually um, what governments are doing around the world. Um, so this data now has uh, covers five quarters since the second quarter of last year until the end of the second quarter this year. Uh, and I'm going to just give you some summary findings from this uh, large data collection process. So it's based on the uh, international norms from the uh, Office of Commission of Human Rights. Um, that emergency responses are acceptable in democracies. Um, as long as they're proportionate, they're necessary and non-discriminatory. And then based on that, uh, the team pulled out seven indicators. Discrimination, derogation of non-derogable rights, abuse of uh, enforcement of restrictions, um, and then more authoritarian practices when you have no time limit on emergency measures, or you put limitations on the legislature, or you engage in disinformation campaigns. Uh, and then in between here, uh, sort of restrictions on the media that harm both sides, right? <clears throat> this is what the world looks like. Um, the deep purple countries have registered major violations based on these seven measures uh, during the pandemic. The blue ones are sort of moderate violations, uh, still worrying 
whereas the different shades of green are less worrying, either minor or no violations that we can register. And all these violations <clears throat> that are in the data set and everything is public, all, all these violations are documented with the official reports and the data set has, has links to all the reporting. So it's fully transparent and, and it can be verified. Now, what's happened over time? Well, there is, um, uh, uh, over this period since March 2020, uh, a slight decline in the number of countries engaging in a major or uh, 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 substantial violations. Um, it's most common in the MENA and Asia Pacific still today and has been uh, mostly throughout this period. Um, and less common in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, and there you see declines. And so in Eastern Europe and Asia, and less than in Western Europe, North America. So you can sort of see from this that there is a certain relationship also <coughs> with democracy in the sense that the sort of more high quality developed liberal democracies tend to have less of violations which is what we would expect, right? Um, and it, it, it shows sort of in terms of the number of countries here, if you look at major violations, we registered 37 of them countries in the second quarter of 2020, and it's down to 19 uh, by the quarter, the second quarter, end of the second quarter, 2021. Um, the maximum count across this period uh, countries that have at some point have had major uh, violations are 44. So substantial. There's not the same uh, start trend with moderate violations. They're going down a little bit, uh, but not as much. And with no violations, no violations, the number of countries have almost doubled, which is, of course, a positive sign. But we still have a substantial number of countries here that are engaging. Oops, sorry in either moderate or in major violations. If you look at how these violations are distributed between the seven types of violations, um, something very worrying appears. It's this. So restrictions on media freedom are by far the most common in general. And it's also the category of the type of violation where you find by far the most major violations. Um, you have some amount of all these limits of legislatures and official disinformation campaigns and discriminatory measures and so on. But it's really freedom of expression, media freedom again. The one area that we saw was most severely affected in general over the past 10 years. And during the pandemic, it's also the area that wannabe autocrats or already dictators have targeted the most. <clears throat> now, one can ask ourselves, okay, so maybe this is justifiable, right? Because, you know, in an uh, emergency with a pandemic, we need some harsh measures. That's what uh, President Duterte and, and Prime Minister Orban have claimed. So we looked at that, and this is now published in Social Science and Medicine, and with some more detail, uh, there's basically no evidence of a trade-off between democracy and avoiding violations and preventing deaths from COVID-19. No relationship whatsoever. Um, so no, um, violations are in terms of what you're allowed to do as an emergency response um, from this perspective cannot be justified. Everything also with the pandem, just like with everything in VDEM, is open source uh, and open access. And everything can be uh, accessed, including this uh, dashboard where you can inspect different countries. Uh, if you want, um, it's available freely online. And the raw data and everything. OK, so we have an, a trend of autocratization that already before the pandemic was accelerating. 
And with the pandemic, dictators and wannabe dictators have used it, especially in the area of freedom of expression and the media, to further derail democratic rights and freedoms. This is, of course, bad from a, a perspective of human rights and democracy uh, because they have uh, uh, intrinsic value in and of themselves. No other system that we know of in modern history uh, preserve the integrity, preserve and, and safeguard the integrity and dignity of human beings. Um, now, there's also uh, other reasons to uh, be worried about this trend. Because <clears throat> there's a growing or a set of growing literatures about the dividends of democracy, the effects of democracy on issues that have to do with human security, economic security, social protection, human health, mitigation of climate change, and war, both international or interstate war and civil war. So we, with support from the European Commission, um, have uh, started a program that we call Case for Democracy to look at these literatures with a top-notch research, top research that has been emerging in the last few years in these areas and what they say about this. So let me give you some quick, um, uh, a quick overview of some of the main uh, messages here. Economic growth and uh, human security in that sense. Scholars like Asimoglu and Robinson have shown with very advanced statistical analysis that countries that democratize increase their GDP per capita with 20% versus countries that remain autocracies and also versus if they had stayed uh, autocratic. Okay. And it's not only a part of the reason here uh, shown by uh, Carl Henry Knudsen is that democracies are better at avoiding the disastrous outcomes. So in this graph in the lower right, you can see autocracies on average have a lower growth rate, yes, uh, than democracies, the red line, but also this tail towards negative growth is much, much longer. And it's much more common that democracies, uh, autocracies, sorry, autocracies have negative growth rates and really disastrous growth rates. Um, so democracy and democratization is good for economic growth and for stable, predictable growth, avoiding catastrophic economic outcomes. And we know catastrophic economic outcomes are terrible for human development and human security. Okay, what about social protection, especially things that um, help the poor, right? So uh, social protection schemes. Well, Murshed and his um, uh, team have shown now with very rigorous uh, uh, analysis of tons of data that democracies and countries that democratize increase their spending on social protection policies. It's even that if you go from no democracy to full democracy, on average, you increase the spending on social protection by 100%. Let's go to human uh, security in terms of health, right? Well, again, here we now have a growing number of studies, and I'm just highlighting two of them here. Um, Bolche et al. published in British, uh, British Medical Journal. Um, no, that one is, uh, sorry, that one is in The Lancet, actually, and then there's another one in, in BMG. But this is a, a study published in The Lancet. Um, showing that countries that democratize uh, increase <coughs> the uh, life expectancy uh, 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 in their years following the transition with a significant amount. Right? And this one in, in BMG looked specifically at countries autocratizing in the last 10 years and look at uh, health outcomes and they are worse in every outcome they look at. So countries that autocratize also then 
have a, a clear negative effect on human development in terms of health. A third study, sorry, there are three studies I refer to here. Wang et al. looking at infant mortality, um, show that, that going from a full autocracy to a full democracy means you reduce the, the, on average, the infant mortality by 94%. That's quite substantial. So this tale that some dictatorships in the world want to try and sell, i.e. China and so on, that dictatorships are better at producing uh, outcomes like better increased human health and, and uh, increased economic development and so on, is really false. It's much more common as a dictatorship that you end up as DRC than as China or Singapore. This is now starting to show even in the area of the Anthropocene or mitigating climate change. So again, very rigorous studies, all the data that's there. And in terms of uh, commitments, national commitments, uh, according to the uh, following the Paris Accord, democracies are much more, um, uh, make much greater commitments, actually commitments that amount to, on average, uh, de a decrease uh, uh, of 1.6 degrees in uh, uh, climate change. That's quite substantial. But also in terms of uh, implementing such commitments, um, this emerging research uh, and uh, increasingly show on this, for example, with air quality uh, and, and so on. Uh, COA emissions, you can go down the line. And finally, this area that we maybe have known most about for a long time, uh, the old uh, argument from Immanuel Kant that uh, about the democratic peace, that democracies don't fight worse with each other. This has now been reconfirmed also using VDEM data. And with the wealth of data we have now, can also calculate statistical probabilities for various outcomes. So for example, after India now turned into an electoral autocracy, um, the odds of a militarized dispute with Pakistan are now three times higher than when it was a democracy. Now, a war between India and Pakistan would be disastrous, of course. But the research now also shows that democracies are not only least prone to have interstate conflict with each other, but also to have internal violent conflicts, so civil war and the like. Now, this relationship, everybody should remember, is curved linear or sort of J-shaped, if you put a J horizontally, because democratization is associated with increased tensions, it's a messy process, and it's associated with higher probability of internal violent conflict. But then, if you reach democracy and become a better democracy, that probability goes down a lot. So the good democracies, that's where you find by far the least of internal violent conflicts. And in, in addition to that, female empowerment, which often comes with democratization, right? Um, or in additionally lower the risk of civil conflict, substantially. And this can also be put in perspective with the current wave of autocratization that is often driven by nationalist, reactionary leaders and parties that also roll back female empowerment, women's rights and girls' children's rights. So all of this, we have summarized them also in, in what we call policy briefs, two pagers that sort of summarize the main argument and give all the academic literature that it's based on. Um, and they are freely available on the website as well. The website, oh, sorry. Um, you can also access the underlying VDEM data, of course, 30 million data points at, at this time some 50 plus indices, 
uh, and over 450 indicators. Uh, we also have these fun tools to play around with if you're not into statistical analysis and R packages and stuff. Um, you can still access the data using uh, these sets of online tools for analysis to do, at least do some descriptive analysis, download them, and use them freely as you want. Um, on that note, let me say thank you for listening. And uh, I look forward to the, the uh, discussion and the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. It's excellent. Um, I have obviously a lot of questions and thoughts, but I know that the audience has also been sending in questions um, here through the, the chat. So why don't we just turn to the questions if, we, if you're ready? Um, I think maybe I'll group them a bit, but we maybe we start off with some questions about the data and, and measurement. So um, let's start with two questions about that. So one, there, there's some question, a question here from Fabio Diaz. How do you reconcile the discrepancy between the data and particular cases? In Colombia between uh, 2020, 2021, there were significant human rights violations yet in the, the map it appears as if not. Mm. Um, so should I give you a couple questions or would you like to take them? Oh, one let me, I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, kind of easy. So with a, with a map, or if I understand it correctly, this refers to the map with a pandemic backsliding. Um, we only count uh, uh, instances of, say, human rights violations that are, can be clearly tied to the government uh, uh, claiming to be fighting COVID. Right? Um, so there could be human rights violations um, that are unrelated to COVID and they would not be registered in the pandemic backsliding data. Okay. So then we have a sort of a follow-up on the pandemic backsliding data about um, from Marta Roig. Can you say more about what is a derogation of individual rights during the pandemic? Um, is the limitation of the individual right not to get vaccinated or not to wear a mask considered a violation? That's getting that, very specifically into the coding, but. <laughs> yeah, um, well, um, uh, uh, individual right not to be vaccinated or wear, wear a mask more um, commonly um, uh, is, is uh, not necessarily in the, in the uh, UN list of uh, human rights, right? Um, so what you would be talking about is physical integrity, freedom from torture, uh, freedom of expression, the, the, the list of non-derogable rights uh, in the UN Charter. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so there's a lot of questions here. There's a lot of interest from the audience. Um, why don't we turn to thinking about some, some trends, going back to the, some of the trends you presented and thinking about variation across regions. So there's a question here from Olufemi Oladipo. What is the difference between African countries' democracy and developed countries' democracy? And maybe we could ask more broadly, uh, you know, are there regional trends, regional variation that... Uh, that you would highlight, or would you highlight variation across, say, wealthy countries, middle-income countries, and, and low-income countries? What sort of variation might you think in, in groups of countries? Yeah. Well, so first I should say that in terms of uh, democracy difference between developed or developing or, or global south, global north, whatever terminology you want to use, when we measure democracy, we uh, we have a global standard, right? Global, both in terms of cross space, different regions, but also over time. Okay? Um, so, uh, in that sense, there is no difference, right? You have to be as democratic and in the same ways, um, more or less, um, uh, to score equally high on, say, the liberal democracy index. Now. We are called, or we, we, we have called ourselves from the very beginning, varieties of democracy, acknowledging that there are different varieties of democracy that are equally democratic, but they have different profiles, if you like. Um, and, and, and the most common one we talk about, or people like to talk about, is liberal democracy or electoral democracy. Um, 
those are two different, right? But they're also participatory democracy, egalitarian democracy, um, and so on. So, um, but that is not tied to any region. I mean, that could be anywhere, right? So you have, when it comes to participatory democracy, right? So it's, yeah, Switzerland, but it's um, also Uruguay, right? Are, are sort of the, the ones with most developed participatory democracy. So um, it's, it's not tied to region and there's no difference between African countries' democracy and developed countries' democracy um, at all. Um, it is, there are clear differences with regional averages. We all know that Middle East and North Africa is worst in the world um, with all the dictatorships there. Mm -hmm. um, but Sub-Saharan Africa is also pretty low on average uh, and now sliding back a little bit. Um, so, so there are regional differences, um, of course. Uh, uh, there's no doubt about that. So there were some more questions about regional differences and um, uh, one question here from Mirna Lopez. Are there any typical characteristics of autocracy by region? So sort of uh, with particular interest here in, in Latin America, would mm. there be uh, typical characteristics that you would pull out by region? No, we haven't. We haven't. Uh looked at that that much um and in part because we measure sort of the extent to which countries have democratic attributes mm -hmm. and then sort of variation between uh different types of dictatorships it's not something we specialize in um but i think i mean it's it's um easy to know that in in the middle east and north africa in the gulf and and north africa you have you still have uh, these kingdoms and, and and sort of traditional authorities, if you like, um, to a, to a greater extent, um, uh, and um, whereas uh, that, well, except for one case in Africa, that doesn't exist anymore, right? Um, so, so we, yes, there are um, there are some regional differences in terms of what type of dictatorships you have. Um, but it's not something that really VDEM is the best source uh, to look at. I think then uh, Geddes and her collaborators and their um, uh, their data set on on autocracies is is it's more informative. Mm -hmm. um, so this is great. I this is really rapid fire questions. I hope you're, you're sure. <laughs> Don't mind. Okay, there's a lot of questions here. There's a lot of interest. There was a lot of interest in the discussion also about um, about the the work that you presented on the business case for democracy, um, and case. especially case. yes, business case, not business no, case case yes, <laughs> and especially the relationship between um, democracy and and growth. So uh, the, let, I'll give you two of the the questions here. So Emil Buff Buffel, apologies for butchering all names. <laughs> um, these are interesting correlations, uh, for instance, economic growth and democracy. However, is it possible to mention some clear causations? For instance, uh, leads to economic growth uh, to democratization or leads democratization to growth. And then a, a related question here, can we say that democracy is a condition for economic development? So this is a big question in political science, definitely. And, and oh. um, yeah, thoughts? Let me start from the back there. Uh, I think uh, that's easiest to answer. And, and the answer is no. Um, there are dictatorships that have had uh, phenomenal growth rates and still have. Um, and uh, uh, present-day China, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan during dictatorship. Uh, so the, I mean, the old debate about the Asian tigers. Um, also earlier in history, don't forget in the 50s and 60s, Soviet Union grew at a phenomenal rate, mm -hmm. right? So there are these instances um, where you have economic development um, without democracy. Um, so it's not a condition for economic development. Uh, but again, uh, if we look at the history 
of dictatorships, especially the modern history of, we say, our data covers from, well, for some countries from 1789, but most of the countries from 1900. From 1900 to the present, it's very, very rare in terms of sort of country years, uh, in the total amount of country years, it's very, very rare that you have instances of dictatorships that have good economic development. Um, they're really exceptional cases. And we can go down, you know, with China, yeah, good growth rates now. We'll see what happens under Xi in the coming years when he's tightening the screws all over the place. But China was also a dictatorship under Mao. And the outcome was not that good, right? And Russia, so, so, sorry, Soviet Union then under Stalin in the 50s into the 60s, good growth rates, then it wasn't that good, right? So even within country variation, um, it typically shows that the, the dictator years with dictatorships, yeah, they can be good, but it's fairly rare. Um, and um, uh, it's much more likely to be uh, uh, associated with terrible outcomes. I mean, the, the outcome of the Mao and the um, cultural revolution, that was a disaster. Also in terms of illnesses and deaths, of, of uh, people, and same with uh, eventually in Soviet Union, of course. Now, it's not, yeah, in, uh, come to the issue of causation and correlation. Correlation is not causation. Now, we live in a world where we cannot play around and do experiments with countries, right? I cannot randomly assign a Putin for X number of country years in world history and see what happens. So we are tied to observational data. Okay. The observational data have um, uh, limitations in terms of inferring causation. But the studies that I refer to here are not only some sort of panel time series correlation, simple stuff. Um, they apply all the most rigorous forms of statistical analysis to control for the possibility of endogenous relationships, such as that um, economic uh, democratization uh, leads to uh, economic development leads to democratization rather than the other way around. So, uh, matching procedures, synthetic controls, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's sort of kind of the best possible we can do um, and the most rigorous testing we can do in terms of whether this is just a correlation or does it actually have, um, uh, the, is there actually evidence suggesting that we're talking about causation? And these studies uh, clearly show that all the evidence uh, now points towards causation. Um, Democratization leads to higher economic growth. Democracies avoid disastrous economic consequences in, to a much greater um, extent than autocracies. Great. Um, thinking about sort of turning the relationship around and what's the relationship between economic growth and economic crisis and democratic backsliding or autocratization, I wonder, um, uh, well, there's a question here, and I wonder if you've done work on it or if, if others at VDEM have been working on this. The question here is from Adelson Sam, Sampao. Uh, do you see any relations between this autocracies, well, between autocratization, the, the phenomenon that we've been talking about, backsliding, and the 2008 financial crisis? Oh, um, yeah. Um, I think that there are no, uh, I haven't seen at least, I haven't seen any sort of definitive studies that can link the 2008 financial crisis and its aftermath directly to autocratization. Um, but let's think about this. Um, what we know from the literature is that financial crises 
increases the probability of regime breakdown, regardless of the regime you have. So it's economic crisis is bad both for autocracies and democracies. Um, but given that in 2008, the world was populated by a majority of democracies, a majority of countries then uh, that were affected by the financial crisis, there, the risk there was to turn into an autocracy. Um, and that's what we see happening. There's also a parallel, of course, to other financial crises. The 1930s and the, the, the uh, development of fascism and Nazism um, and uh, a great number of democracies falling victim uh, to that development, including Germany, that was maybe the most democratic country at the time. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. The parallel there, of course, uh, is also uh, at least worrying, uh, if not instructive. And then the evolutionary biologists. I work with one um, uh, in, in a project called Failing and Successful Sequences of Democratization. Um, I've been doing so. And they would tell us we're still herd animals, right? Our genes haven't shown much change uh, over the past hundred years. We're still herd animals. Right? And herd animals, in times of crisis, look for a strong leader that can take you out of the crisis. Um, uh, horses do the same, right? They follow the leader, even if it instinctively goes back into the barn that's on fire. Um, and so we have, they would say, we still have that instinct that when we feel threatened and our livelihood is threatened, maybe our kids and parents and all that, um, then we want somebody to come and save us. Right? Um, and, and that opens up for these strong leaders with simple populist messages and say, I can fix this. Follow me and I'll fix it. And they will point to the threats, whether it's migration or it's secularism or it's uh, lesbian gays and so on. Um, and, and find the scapegoats uh, that uh, needs to be sort of worst case eradicated, right? Um, and, um, uh, and, and use that often as a, as a uh, justification for derailing civil liberties and things like media freedom and suppress civil society and their foreign agents or something else. Okay. Uh, and, and that's a very typical pattern that we see in the data, right? Increasing polarization that's driven and often driven and or at least sort of further cultivated by mm -hmm. the populist leaders that have authoritarian tendencies. And then using that polarization to scare people further and then use that fear to undermine democratic rights and freedoms and human rights. Um, fear is a very, very dangerous political force. And we know that from the 1930s. So I wanted to pick up on that. And, and you talked in your presentation also about, you know, we, we see a similar, similar processes of autocratization across, across countries. Um, so we've got about seven more minutes and I thought it may be a good last set of questions can be around what what to do what can the international community do what should the civil what should civil society be doing what can we be thinking about in terms of response so i mean thinking about these processes that that you've that you've identified in your work are there countries where you would i which where you would identify for particular uh, areas of concern areas of concern you would particularly identify and then where would you see um uh, areas where the international community or civil society actors might respond. Uh, mm -hmm. I can also pick up a question here from the, the Q&A that, that's along related lines. Uh, so this is from Rodrigo Oliveira, one of our PhD or one of our um, research associates here. And he asks, what, is, what are your thoughts about the role of social media and fake news in autocratic trends? And how can we deal with it uh, without affecting freedom? So mm -hmm. how to respond to these trends mm -hmm. that, that we've, you've identified? Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, let me start back from the back again. Um, the social media. Um, I didn't. I didn't bring up that uh, in my presentation today. But we have a sister project, or a sort of a baby that's been born out of by some Vedam folks. That's called Digital Society Project. That measure. Um, among other things, then the extent to which governments use social media to spread this information. Um, and that's very clear that it's also governments doing uh, sort of fake news and whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, it's very clearly associated with autocratization. It's one of the tools in the wannabe dictator's playbook. Um, and it's often related to this issue that I spoke about to increase polarization, right? Spread fake news about a scapegoat group, scapegoat group and about your political opponents uh, and make your followers believe in that false story in order to feel more fear so that you can use that fear and anxiety uh, to further undermine democratic rights and human rights. In addition, of course, we have um, we have all these other groups that are not necessarily government controlled, although Putin has his troll fabrics and so on. Um, but um, uh, extreme groups on the right, religious groups, extreme re extremist religious groups, um, and, and also extremists on the left, although in the current period that's less common and less prominent. Um, who use the social media. And, and the, problem, the problem is really, I mean, we know the problem. The problem is that there was this crazy uh, person out there somewhere in a vill village or, or a small town, and nobody listened, right? Whereas today, that crazy person can get uh, all, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of followers and spread all these conspiracy theories and things to a much wider group. Um, and that's a problem for, for democracy. If democracy, the, the discussion, democracy dies with the lies. Democracy is predicated on us knowing what the facts are. And facts are facts, whether we believe them or not. Um, and democracy cannot survive uh, when the lies take over. Um, so this is a real dilemma. I think after World War II, the world was, after Nazism and fascism, the world was facing, okay, so how do we limit freedom of association in order to save it? Okay. And that was, that's why uh, post-World uh, War II Germany went so far as to sort of outlaw, uh, outlaw uh, Nazi parties, Nazi symbols, uh, and have a constitutional court that can review which parties or organizations are unconstitutional. And, and their legal system sort of goes um, not the farthest, but far among democracies. It's much less in the U.S., for example, where you can wave your Nazi flag as much as you want. Um, now, we are now facing this, the, the sort of the equivalent when it comes to freedom of expression. Freedom of expression has become so unregulated in social media and on the net that it's used to undermine democracy and threaten democracy and threaten freedom of expression itself. So what we need to figure out now, uh, and we sort of in a, some sort of global sense, is how to limit freedom of expression in order to save it. There is no doubt in my mind about that. Uh, it can come with self-regulation and self-sanitation from the social media companies. I wonder if that's going to be enough. Um, but I, I, I don't have a sort of perfect solution. Here's the silver bullet, right? But it has to be done somehow. Um, that's clear. Uh, 
So maybe I only got to the last question, but I'm, I apologize for that. But I think it's an important one. It's really in terms of democracy, especially in the developed sort of long-standing democracies, mm -hmm. it's really a key, key challenge. I think it's an important, uh, important point to, for uh, certainly speaking to the first question as well. With the important point for policymakers to be taking, taking, uh, paying attention to. Um, so we're at the end of our time. Unfortunately, we could keep going here because there's a lot of questions in the chat, and I certainly have a lot of questions. Um, but I need to bring the discussion to a close, and maybe this is a, a good place to do it. Um, this is certainly, I, as we've seen, a moment, a, a period of concern for democracy and political freedoms and, politic and freedom around the world. And uh, uh, we should be thinking about what to do as, as global citizens and as the international community and as members of civil society. Um, so thank you, Stefan, for joining us. Thank you for your, your lecture and thank you for engaging with all of our, our questions here. Um, and thank you to the audience for, for great questions and great engagement. Thank you.